Hello everyone and welcome back to the channel. It is currently a weekday after work, which means I am extremely tired. Uh, trying to grind out some videos before I go away for the weekend, going to Indiana for the Indy 500. So if you happen to be watching this on a Sunday, it means I'm probably blackout in the middle of a field somewhere. Uh, but in the meantime, let's go ahead and learn about some systems design. So today we're going to be talking about video group chats, uh, specifically something like Zoom or Skype. Without further ado, let's jump into it. All right. So let's go ahead and get into things. So the past that, uh, or like the last time that I made this video, I was basically going ahead and saying that I thought it would be kind of unrealistic to ask for a systems design interview. And as I make it this time, I'm actually starting to kind of go back on that thought because I think that there are probably a couple of aspects of this video that you couldn't possibly ex be expected to know. But I do actually think that, um, you know, if you had to extrapolate out this problem just using some reason and you were asked less specifically about, you know, like actually transmitting video over the internet, it's actually not too unreasonable of a video to make. So let's go ahead and get into things. So if you're not familiar with Zoom or Skype, if you've been under a rock for the last few years, uh, here is an example of what it might look like. Typically what you'll have is some sort of video call as I've displayed on the iPad. As you can see, here's an example of me at my beach house mansion, sitting at my desk, got a nice infinity pool slash ocean in the outside. And then we've got Corinna Kopp also on the call with Alexandra Daddario and also Anna de Armas. I can't show what their screens are displaying because uh, you know it would not be fair to them. Obviously this was a screenshot taken off of my real computer. Would not want to violate their privacy. Okay, so let's actually formalize some problem requirements. Number one is we can support both one-on-one -on -one and group video chats. Number two should be that we can support pretty large calls, up to 100 people at a time, which uh, if you're a working software engineer like myself, you'll know that these do happen pretty frequently. Uh, number three is that uh, we should be able to record all of these video calls from some sort of centralized server or you know, on the back end, right? It shouldn't necessarily be me using my computer to do it. That can overload my client. So again, we should be able to upload those to the cloud for later access. Cool. So the first thing that we're gonna do is start off by quickly doing a refresher on networking. Uh, if you watch the video game video that I made last week, uh, you should hopefully have this pretty fresh in your mind. But if you didn't, because you're an asshole and you don't like watching these videos in order, uh, basically, we've got TCP and UDP. Uh, TCP has all sorts of protections involved with sending packets over the network. This involves trying to send them in order, right? If a client receives a packet from someone else, uh, what it can do is say, ooh, you know what, I'm actually missing a sequence number that I should have, can you send me that one first before I apply this guy? Number two is that you resend dropped packets, uh, which is another nice optimization, so you don't just drop things and never send them again. Uh, number three is that we initially establish a connection via a three-way handshake, so clients aren't receiving any packets from people that they haven't agreed to receive them from. And number four is that we also have congestion control and flow control. So congestion, congestion control is when I'm sending packets, I'm gonna limit how many I send. Flow control is the receiver is basically giving me back information saying like, whoa there, don't send any more. I'm already having trouble processing these. Cool. The next thing is that as far as we are concerned with video chats, we don't actually really care about getting every single packet, right? So if every, imagine every packet is a frame or something like that it is okay for me to drop a couple of frames here and there and not get them back. The reason being that you know, if I'm doing a video chat and uh, I lose a frame and then I get the next frame, I don't want the old frame again. I don't care anymore. You've just buffered and whatever, it's done now. So generally speaking, what we actually want to use here is UDP because UDP is going to be a little bit faster because it doesn't have all of these protections that TCP has and it's not like we really need them for video chatting anyway. So UDP is probably going to be the way to go here, at least for the actual sending of the video and the audio itself. For other stuff, perhaps not. Cool. Next, we're gonna be talking about peer-to-peer -peer communication. So you might think to yourself, well, obviously for something like a video chat or just with networking in general, the way to make things as fast as possible is to communicate with two computers directly, right? You wanna get as little involved in the middle because that always adds overhead in terms of them actually processing those packets and then sending them out again, it takes a little bit. So ideally, if I'm video chatting with you, we want to be sending each other packets directly, right? Well, the question is, is this actually always going to be the case? So maybe if it's the two of us together, however, if it's us two and your entire company, now all of a sudden we're all sending one another packets and that can add a lot of load on our client devices. So that is a problem right there. And also, what if we wanted to actually record this video footage? 
Well, now all of a sudden, basically, whoever is doing that recording probably needs to be ingesting all of the video footage from all of these different places, right? It could be up to 100, and then actually compiling them together. And that could be a very expensive operation too. So it may not necessarily be something that we want to be doing. That being said, for just the sake of a one-on-one -on -one video chat, peer-to-peer -peer communication does seem ideal. So let's say it was a one-on-one -on -one call, how would we actually go ahead and do a peer-to-peer -peer communication? <clears throat> For me to cover a topic like this, I think it is a good prerequisite that we first understand something in modern networking known as Network Address Translation, or NAT for short. So basically the gist here is that every single device that we use that's connected to the network has some sort of IP address, right? However, you might think that you know uh, your laptop and your smart TV on your Wi-Fi have separate IP addresses. And technically that's true. However, in reality, when they go and communicate with the public network, which is basically anyone that's not on your Wi-Fi, uh, they're both basically being abstracted away under one IP address known as your public IP address. So basically, you have some sort of NAT device, like this over here, that's gonna keep a mapping right, uh, from B to A, where B is your public IP address, and then A is going to be your private IP address. Now, all the devices on your local network can see each other's private IP addresses, but we want to basically mask that private IP address publicly simply for the sake that um, you know, it's, it's going to allow us to add extra security, number one, so that no one has direct access to your IP address. And number two, and also pretty important, is that if we're using IPv4, again, we're really getting into the weeds here, probably not that important for your standard systems design interview, uh, we have a limited number of possible addresses that we can use, and so as a result, uh, we have to figure out a way to make the public IP address space smaller, and the way that we do that is basically by just saying, oh, for every single local network, you just get one public IP address. Cool, so hopefully that makes sense. But the gist is, you know, we've got some NAT device here. Our client device has one IP address A. The NAT device is exposing it as some other IP address B with a, a certain port. And then uh, it goes to the server, says, hey, I'm contacting you on IP address B. The server reaches back out to B. The NAT device maps that back to A. And then that goes right back to the client. So the gist is, the reason we call it network address translation is because the NAT device is doing that translating from public address back to private address. So let's continue talking about the NAT space a little bit because this is important for how two clients can actually directly communicate with one another. Uh, as far as NAT is concerned, there is another concept here known as the stun, conserver, uh, the stun server. So the N in stun server actually does stand for NAT, uh, but I can't remember the full acronym, and frankly, it's not important. I'm kind of uh, you know, going on a bit of a tangent here, but uh, I think it is relevant for the rest of the video. It's just that you know, if I were an interviewer and I were to ask you this question, I wouldn't expect you to just like, be able to conjure up uh, the concept of NAT unless you were someone who's been working with networks for a while. Cool. So just as you would reach out to the stun server, right? Both clients can reach out to it, figure out their private IP addresses, or rather the private IP address of the other party, and then all of a sudden now they can communicate directly. Problem is, this doesn't always even work. Depending on the NAT device that you're using, uh, stun just may not uh, you know, expose your private IP address properly, and you may just always have to communicate through that NAT device, in which case your latency is always gonna go down because now we have an extra hop on the network. Regardless, let's go talk about an actual centralized chat server. Because like I mentioned, when we have a group chat, the actual feasibility of using peer-to-peer uh, -peer communication directly tends to go down quite a bit. So what is the main benefit of the central chat server? Like I mentioned, each client really only has to listen to and send videos to one place. And this is pretty crucial because if we had to listen to 100 different other clients and we had to send video to 100 different other clients and we were doing this on something like a mobile phone, you could expect that battery to die pretty darn quickly. Cool, what is the con? Well, our server is going to be under a bunch of load, right? If we've got 100 different people sending video at say 24 frames per second all to this server at 1080p, uh, that server is gonna get pretty overloaded. So. How do we actually want to be able to handle this video on the centralized server uh, so that we can basically maximize uh, the efficiency of this server and minimize the amount of load on it? Well, let's take a look at option number one. Option number one is that the centralized server is going to take in all the streams from, the, uh, from all the clients and basically compile it down into one simple video, right? So we take all of these frames, merge them together somehow, and then export that out all to uh, the clients that are interested in our video chat stream. So there are a few cons to this approach, which is ultimately why we're not gonna go with it. 
Number one is that actually doing this transpilation on the server is itself going to use a lot of CPU load, so that's not ideal. And then number two is that every single client has to watch the same stream. So something like this might be acceptable for Twitch where you're really only looking at one stream at a time. But for something like video chatting, we want all customized experiences, right? If I'm a teacher presenting, maybe I'm a student uh, and I wanna see the whiteboard as the big screen and not the teacher's face and someone else, uh, if the teacher is a baddie, might wanna see that teacher's face. So, you know, that's how it goes sometimes. So the question is, how can we actually improve this? Well, now we're going to talk about something known as selective forwarding, which is definitely something that we see quite a bit in actual video chat applications. So option two allows us to have a customizable experience per user, because basically what we're gonna do now is only send clients the streams they actually care about and in the resolutions that they care about them. So let's go ahead and make an example here. Let's say our Zoom call looks something like this, right? We've got all the best world leaders on one Zoom call. We've got Trump, Kim Jong-un, Putin, and Stalin. He came back from the dead. So let's imagine that in my particular view, I've got Trump as the big guy. And so over a WebSocket, I can communicate with the centralized server and say, hey, on my particular view, I want Trump as an HD stream. I want Kim Jong as an SD stream, Putin as an SD stream, and Stalin as an SD stream. If I was getting HD feeds for all of these guys, that would be a lot more load on my server, and that would be not great. It would just overload the network unnecessarily, and then it would also have to basically just like downsample all of those um, streams to a lower resolution. So it doesn't help me to do that at all. I just want the lower resolution variant. If for whatever reason, you know, I were to put Stalin on the big screen and Trump goes back here, then you know, we can change that over such that Stalin is HD, Trump is SD, and the way that we would do that is just by having the WebSocket between my client and the main server uh, reflect that, and the server is going to cache it such that as new frames come in, it knows what to send me. So let's keep talking about this selective forwarding a little bit because there is actually going to be a little bit more nuance here. The question now becomes, if the server can send me multiple different types of streams, right, or multiple different resolutions, or multiple encodings, or anything like that, again, I don't really want to get into video specifics here, A, because I don't know that much about them, and B, because I don't expect your interviewer would expect you to either. How is it that the client is actually going to send all of the data that the central server needs to do selective forwarding? So, option number one is the client sends a single stream to the central server. The central server basically converts it to a bunch of other formats or resolutions or anything that you might need. And then it's going to basically send it out to all of the clients that care about it. So this is good because the client only has to send one stream, right? At the same time, it's not so good because the server has to do a bunch more work. And that we really don't want because that is going to be the failure scenario, right? If our server is going down all the time, we can't have a video chat in the first place, uh, regardless of how much load is on the client. So that leads us to option number two. The client still only has to send one stream to our, uh, to our central server. However, this time it actually goes through an intermediary server. So this intermediary server can do all of the processing on that stream to convert it to multiple different resolutions and then send that to the central server. Now in theory, this seems like a really, really great deal because uh, you know, the client now only has to send one stream. And additionally, the central server doesn't have to do any extra processing on it. So this idea of like a proxy server seems to work really nicely. At the same time, when you introduce yet another intermediary server, that is just more latency and more time that it takes for all of these frames to actually get to the central server for it to send them out. And so it's going to cause more lag in your video chats. So in reality, what we often see most of these video chat applications do is take approach number three which is that basically the client is still going to do all of this encoding, but it's gonna do it all locally. So maybe instead of sending out one stream, now we're gonna send out three streams. So the client is going to have to do a little bit more work, which is unfortunate, but ideally it shouldn't be so much because you're only doing it for one stream at a time. So we send these multiple streams all the way to our central server, and then right there, it means a little bit more work for the client device, but no extra load on the central server to do more encoding. And uh, you know, now it has all the information that it needs right off the bat to send that right back to all the clients. So this is the approach that often gets taken. Now basically everything I've described so far is uh, known as uh, WebRTC, which is basically some technology that abstracts all of this away from us. Uh, but again, I think that you know, mentioning or having to have that knowledge in an actual systems design interview uh, 
would be pretty unnecessary because the whole point is to interview for generalists and see if they can recognize the patterns here. Cool. Now let's talk about partitioning and replication because obviously this is going to be important for any time that we have a centralized server. So the main idea here is that you know if we have a bunch of different video calls, ideally we want one centralized server per call. So what do we do? Well, we shard on chat ID. That should be pretty simple. We can use consistent hashing to make sure that uh, you know every server is getting a relatively even amount of load. It is possible, I guess, in theory, that one of these servers for a given chat may actually getting, uh, be getting so much load that we have to partition it out even further. And if we really did need to do that, I guess what we could do is use two or three chat servers basically uh, spread out which users have to send video footage to which server and then now every single user is listening to say two or three servers instead of just one. So you do have to do a little bit more work on the read path but the work on the write path stays the same and then this way uh, that central server basically only has to uh, keep track of all the configuration that it needs for a couple of different users at the time. Cool. So the next aspect of this is going to be replication. How do we make sure that our central server, if it goes down, uh, our video chat uh, does not completely crash and burn? I guess the gist here is that what we can do is use centralized servers in kind of like a active passive configuration as we've seen with load balancers in the past. So what this really means is basically, you know, we have some passive backup that just sits there doing nothing. We've got a zookeeper cluster that's constantly getting heartbeats from our main node. And then if our main central server goes down, uh, the backup basically uh, you know, says to Zookeeper, oh, you know what, I'm actually going to be the primary now. And then everyone reestablishes their WebSocket connection with the, the backup because they're going to hear from Zookeeper also saying, hey, uh, this has just changed for this particular node. And then now all of a sudden we're good to go. So yep, that should be simple enough. Uh, we've seen this pattern plenty on this channel. Cool. Another thing to note is that we don't really need to keep any state on the backup, the reason being that all of this is pretty much stateless, right? We're basically just forwarding UDP streams. You could argue that uh, the state of what streams each user wants uh, could maybe be pre-cached in the backup to go for like a more seamless transition, but at the same time, I think that on re-establishing those web sockets, uh, this is not gonna be a particularly large data model and each user could just go ahead and tell the backup uh, which streams it wants to perform selective forwarding. Okay, the final aspect of this problem, like I mentioned, is to talk about video recording. So the first thing to note is that we don't want to be doing this on the central server. This is something that I said I would do on the central server on maybe another thread in uh, my last version of this video or the last version of this series, and I do regret saying that, so let's go ahead and change that up. Basically the gist is we can have other servers that subscribe to the video call and also perform the encoding that we need to actually make this recording and put it in S3. So let's say that we just need one recording, right? Um, we just need one version of the recording where, you know, it's like the active speaker is always going to be the big frame on the video chat. And, uh, you know, that's just going to be what we have access to after the fact. That's fine. We can probably do that easily enough by having our central server here, our recording server here, and then the recording server is going to take in all those frames, you know, do some work on them on another thread and then upload them to S3. Easy enough. However, Sometimes it may be the case that you don't just want, you know, one version of the Zoom call, but you actually want like full high definition views of every single user's stream throughout the duration of the call. If for whatever reason this were going to be the case, it may be the case that this guy right here, the recording server, could get overloaded, right? Because now instead of just doing selective forwarding where it's like, you know, one HD stream and maybe one SD stream and maybe one more SD stream, you might need a hundred full-on HD streams and that could overload this guy, that would be bad. So like we mentioned, uh, you know, being able to get all user streams could be too expensive. Why don't we go ahead and distribute this thing? So to do that, what we would basically do is we would have multiple different recording servers still basically doing the same exact thing as clients, right? They would establish over here via WebSocket which streams they actually want access to. So maybe this guy gets, uh, you know, the stream for user one in HD this guy over here gets the stream for user two in HD. This guy over here gets the stream for user three in HD. They can go ahead and cache those, throw them in Kafka. That's right, Jordan's back, he's using Kafka. We shard this queue on our recording ID, or rather the chat ID, because you know, 
we just need them all to be together. If they're from the same chat, so they can be combined eventually. And then we've got some stateful stream consumer. The reason I say stateful is because if this guy were to go down, uh, it would be bad if we had to restart reading all the frames from Kafka. It would be great if uh, we could just pull a checkpoint from S3 and continue encoding from there. And then the stateful stream consumer will in turn sync the final recordings over to S3. Cool. Uh, the one other thing to note is that, you know, because we have all of these uh, frames coming from different sources, it's possible that if one of them is a little bit slow to consume that footage, that they might not be perfectly aligned in Kafka, right? This guy might upload way before, or maybe five seconds before, this guy down here. And so if that's going to be the case, you know, how does uh, the stream consumer actually know, well, uh, you know, at this frame, this guy is lined up with this guy. Well, fortunately, every frame is going to have some timestamp from the central server. So the central server can actually just export that timestamp with the frame. And that way, eventually, this stream consumer can basically use the timestamp of each frame to properly align all of the footage. Cool. So let's go ahead and look at our full on diagram over here. Basically, if we have a call client on the left, right, this guy's our chat client, the first thing that he's going to do is go to the load balancer with his chat ID. Now, the chat ID is probably something that's going to be encoded in the actual link that he clicks to open the Zoom. So once he does that, the load balancer, which listens to Zookeeper, is going to use the consistent hashing policy to map him over to our chat server. Once we have a chat server, we're going to do two things. We're going to establish a WebSocket connection, and this is going to be for the selective forwarding because the chat server needs to know which streams I want. And then in addition, we're also going to start subscribing to UDP feed. So the UDP feed over here, right, this guy, is going to be the incoming frames and audio of other users. Simultaneously, our user also has to send a few variants of their stream over to the chat server. Maybe we've got a 1080, a 720p, and a 480p, and all three of those are three different UDP streams that the chat server can go ahead and ingest. In addition, we've got our passive chat server over here, which again is listening to Zookeeper, basically just waiting for the chat server to go down. And if it does, it'll take over, claim its place in Zookeeper, and then we can proceed as normal. Finally, as far as recording goes, let's imagine that we did in fact want to uh, process a lot of video footage here, so much so that we needed multiple nodes to actually take uh, in the recording data. So imagine now that we have stream ingress server number one and two, they're both listening to UDP feed. They're both connected as well via WebSocket to basically say what exactly it is that they want, right? And again, you know, if we really want to get into the weeds here, they can also use some sort of consistent hashing policy such that server one is responsible for one range of users' footage and server two is responsible for another range of users' footage. But the gist is they're going to take in all this footage. They're going to throw it in Kafka with its timestamp, which we partition on our chat ID. And then over here in our stateful consumer, I use Flink, use whatever you want. You know I love Flink, sorry. Uh, basically, we're gonna go ahead and cache all of this stuff, combine it uh, however it is that we want to do so, and then finally sync it to S3 for later access. Well guys, I hope you enjoyed this video. I personally am falling asleep, so I'm sorry for stuttering a little bit, uh, but hopefully it did actually make sense this time around. Anyways, enjoy your night and have a great day.